Hey, campfire crew, let's get it on. Is it safe? No, it's not safe. It's very dangerous. Be careful. Creep from my past, submitted by Cherokee Cobb. I'm going to leave the towns and names etc. out of this because I'm now just telling people about this. The only other people I told are a cousin, my boyfriend, and his aunt. I'm not ready to tell this to everyone, including people that know him. It was really traumatizing for me, and you'll learn once why I get into the story. I was 16 when my parents moved to this small town. And I was a shy kid who just wanted the day over with, to just go home, so it was really hard to make friends. The town was super nice. No one was bullied. It was literally a dream come true. I had been constantly bullied until I moved there, so it was nice to actually come out of my shell. I made friends with a new group, super nice kids. But then I made friends with this boy, and he was super nice. We walked home together because we lived close together, and my parents thought he was a nice kid too, and they didn't really like me hanging around boys, being a teen girl. This older teen who was a senior, though, was constantly flirting with me, and me being a curious teen, I was flirting back. This other neighbor that was friends with me, though, didn't really like that. He became constantly clinging, and I mean following any way he could. Waiting outside the bathroom at school for me, walking me to my door, and I didn't notice it at first, but then it clicked, and I began thinking to myself, he needs to stop before my dad murders him. The neighbor friend ended up missing a few months worth of school, and I got kind of concerned, because he still was my friend at the time, and I just wanted him to stop acting like a clingy boyfriend. He finally came back, and I got to ask him what happened. Here I was thinking he got the flu, or maybe a family matter came up. I was beyond wrong. As calm as ever, he explained that he got into a fight with his dad, and his dad said something that set him off. He tried grabbing his dad's gun, and he said if he hadn't gotten caught, he would have shot his dad. But his dad stopped him, and just instantly put him in a mental home so he could calm down. I later found out through his mom, who saw me walking home one day, that he had done this before and had tried so much more that they just had to take a break because before he tried shooting his dad, he hurt his little sister on purpose and she ended up in the hospital. I think it was a broken leg. I looked at my friend like he was joking, but he continued to try and get me on his side. He had this crazy look on his face. So I tried making an excuse to get somewhere else, but none of my friends were around and I didn't have a phone yet to fake a call. So I had just agreed with him that his dad had made him mad on purpose to calm him down. Skipping to the next semester, my parents ended up moving closer to my dad's job, in this town an hour from my old town. Weeks went by and I didn't really talk to my neighbor friend, mainly my two other friends who I considered my best friends. It's now years later and I still have them as friends, and once in a while we catch up on life. I made more friends and got into a bunch of activity groups including choir. I somehow started talking to my old neighborhood friend again, don't ask why. I was 16 and missing that small town, and I was constantly trying to get a hold of all my old friends, including him. We had a streak on Snap, and he explained that he had this girlfriend and he seemed a lot better in life, especially with his dad. We got closer together as friends like we were before, he got weird, and we were spilling secrets. I learned new stuff about him, and so did he. I told him how my cousin had raped me when I was nine and absolutely no one knew at the time except two friends from middle school who are still my best and closest friends to this day. I told him how hard it was to trust anyone and he said I could trust him and that he was sorry that it happened. I let him in as a close friend and I really regretted it. He instantly got back to being that clingy ex but only this time it was worse. He was constantly sending dick pics on Snap, and I told him to stop because I was getting uncomfortable, and he said that I could have it because he broke up with his girlfriend for me. I instantly felt bad, because now some girl was heartbroken that he dated for almost a year, because he probably told her that we were going to date, 
and she probably hated me now. I told him that I never said I wanted to date him, and that I don't want a boyfriend right now because of the trauma I was going through. He said if I disagreed with him again that he would take another pick of his area and would make sure my parents knew that we were having sex. I told him to knock it off, and he listened and went back to being that supportive friend. But I didn't really talk to him after that. Just kept the streak that we had. I don't know why my brain decided to go on autopilot while I was letting close friends know about my choir concert next week. I sent him a message about it. I instantly regretted it and hoped for the best that maybe he was too busy that night of the choir concert. Of course he wasn't, and he said he already told his parents that he was spending the night at the concert with his grandparents' house. His grandparents and close relatives of my old friends lived in my new town, hence why I was sending invites to old friends. He tried explaining that we could be friends with benefits and have a night together when he got there. I instantly shot him down and said I only wanted to hang out that night with friends and catch up. He said okay and didn't really say anything except the night of the party that he was in town and headed to the school to catch a good seat. I got there, waved at him, letting him know that I was happy he was there. The concert went by and we were all getting ready to leave and he instantly found me and gave me a hug. He told me that he wanted to go somewhere more private because of how loud everyone was and I stupidly agreed. We went behind the school building and were sitting on these top steps. As we were sitting down, he instantly started kissing me, and at first I followed along just to the kissing because it did excite me. It was my first real kiss, but let me tell you, it was wet and sloppy, and eventually it made me want to puke. I broke the kiss and his hand started to roam around my body, him explaining that his grandparents weren't home, and that he brought a condom. I pushed his hand away and told him no, and he laughed quietly and got back to kissing his hands again trying to roam around my body. I grabbed his hands and told him no again, and he whispered in my ear, I know you want me. You're going to like it once it happens. I can be your first. He scooted closer, and my heart just suddenly stopped as he slid his hand roughly down my pants, stopping right above my panty line. I was full on panicking. I started to have a panic attack and grabbed onto his hand, and I was too scared to tell him to fuck off and remove his hands. He wasn't a strong kid, but he was stronger than me at the time. And now I work out and work on my upper body core, so I could easily kick his ass if I ever saw him again. He was still trying to get in my pants, and thankfully a car drove by, and it made him draw his hand back and scoot away from me before the people saw us. I took that opportunity and shot up, explaining that my parents were wanting me at home as I glanced at my phone I had recently got. He looked at the clock and agreed. I told him before we met that my parents knew I was going to meet up with him, and he was beyond scared of my dad. He got up and followed me to the end of the road, and I let him lean in for a kiss before I stepped back and just waved him goodbye. He waved goodbye, and I waited till I was around the corner and just broke into tears. I fell on the ground sobbing about what happened and got up to run home. I didn't want my parents knowing about anything, I just never wanted to see him again. But I told my parents it took forever to get home because one of the teens on stage fell and couldn't walk for a minute or something like that, and they approved why I was so late. They knew the time the choir had started and when it was supposed to end. They called my choir teacher and everything and had super strict parents, one of the reasons why I didn't tell them about it. When I got to my room, I found that this friend had snapped me already, texted me a few times, explaining that it would have gotten fun if that car hadn't drove by. I told him that I never wanted to have sex with him, and that he made me feel scared. Then he said I wasn't a virgin, so it wouldn't have mattered if we had sex. I told him that I was a virgin, and he put a laughing emoji out and said I wasn't because my cousin raped me and took my virginity. He knew not to bring that kind of stuff up and I instantly cried. He told me it wasn't such a big deal over my cousin, and said that he wanted to be my first instead of my cousin. I instantly blocked him on everything, and he tried a few times to get a hold of me, but I ignored him. Thank God I didn't tell him where I lived so he couldn't stalk me. It took me forever to gain trust in my new friends, and my best friend this day still helps me through hard times. 
It took me forever to gain trust in my new boyfriend a year after this had happened. I mean, he was just a gentleman when I met him in sophomore year, and it made me question it completely. He's my best friend, and his aunts are the closest people that know me. I mean, seven years, and he's still the really sweet boyfriend to me. As for my other friend, I really hope he got help that he needed. I don't really think of him, until now, and I don't try to contact him either. It took me years to get over that, and just go forward in life. I have a daughter now, and I'm going to try like heck to make sure she knows it's okay to stand up for herself over boys who try to force what they want, and that it's always her body, her choice. She's almost two, and she knows no means no, and that you're not touching her or wanting a hug if she doesn't want to. It makes me beyond proud of her and me, especially on how far I've come. Skull in the Water by Lake T. Me and two friends went and rented a boat on Lake Okeechobee in Florida. We got a 30-foot pontoon boat that had a cover, although there was no cabin or anything under the main deck. It was winter in South Florida, so it's cold, but not too cold. So we just decided to sleep on the boat instead of setting up a camp. We planned on spending three days and two nights on the lake. We just spent our time drinking, fishing, and playing games. It was sometime on the second night when I just woke up. I was still drunk from our previous activities, but my senses were on overdrive, and I just felt aware of something. I was sleeping towards the back of the boat while my friends were at the front, and it was eerily calm with no waves on the water. We were about 250 feet from shore with land on our port side, and I started scanning the tree line looking for something. There was nothing on land, so I scanned the water on the port side. Nothing. So I scanned the water aft of the boat. Nothing. I didn't want to disturb my friends up front, so I just scanned the water on the starboard side, and that's when I saw it. There was a skull floating in the water with just the eye sockets and part of the nasal cavity, sitting there in the water looking right at me about 50 feet away. An immediate sense of dread took over me. I was the most scared I'd ever been in my life. But then an even worse feeling took over. Calmness and the sudden urge to jump in the water. I had the notion that I would be at home in peace if I just jumped in, and before I could act on it, I think one of my friends stirred in their sleep because I heard a beer bottle start rolling near the front of the boat. This snapped me out of it and the feeling of dread went away. I yelled at my friends to get up while I moved to start the engines. One didn't respond at all, while the other drunkenly told me to fuck off. I yelled again that I wasn't fucking around. I was about to pull the starter on the engine and yell again at my friends when I heard something. I froze and listened closely, and there was a very faint splashing sound that was slowly getting closer to the boat. I forgot about yelling at my friends and focused on starting the engine. I pulled and pulled and pulled on the starter, and nothing happened. But in between the pulls, I heard the splashing getting closer. I didn't dare look at the direction of the noise. Finally, the engine started, and I punched it out of there. I must have gone miles before I came to a stop to conserve fuel. And until the sun rose and my friends woke up, I spent the rest of the night scanning the waters just in case. I had to make up a bullshit excuse to explain to my friends why we were so far away from our previous spot. I mean, I wanted to tell them, but I doubted they would believe me. When I got home, I did some research, and apparently Native American tribes possibly used the lake as a burial ground. Plus, there are thought to be the bodies of many victims of hurricanes throughout the decades lying in that lake. Fishermen have found many human bones over the years. This was over six years ago, and I've yet to set foot near any body of water larger than my shower. The lakes, oceans, rivers, water parks, pools, hot tubs, nothing. I don't blame anyone if they don't believe some random guy on the internet. Many times I try to write it off as my drunk self seeing things. However, I can't write off the feeling that I had of wanting to jump into the water with something real or not that struck me with terror thinking about that feeling of wanting to go in the water with whatever was out there chills me to this day.
Party Crasher, submitted by Maggie J. At the end of every summer, our neighborhood holds a giant block party. This was usually done at the end of September after everyone was back to school, Labor Day stuff was out of the way, and it was like one last fling before fall really hit. Everyone pitched in. There were dads grilling and smoking food all day, moms baking and setting up tables and all kinds of games, a bounce house, and just a really good time. Last year, a band was hired for the afternoon, and things got rolling on that Saturday. It was great from the first minute, and I was having a blast from the start. There was a big field behind the houses, so there was a water balloon toss that was really fun, and it was then that my friend Paul and I noticed a guy we didn't recognize hanging around the edges of the toss. This wasn't super unusual, as people invited all kinds of friends and family to our party, but this guy was weird in a way, and we noticed he was taking a lot of pictures. I forgot about it to run around with my friends and get something to eat. The band started up and more people showed up throughout the afternoon. When the music stopped and the band took a break, I saw that guy again. He really wasn't talking to anyone, he was just taking more pictures and walking around. No one noticed, but I thought it was weird and said something to my mom. She was a few glasses of wine in and said to not worry about it. My other friend Chrissy and a bunch of us were in the bounce house and just yelling and having fun when the parents said it was time for the littler kids to use the bounce house and we got kicked out. There were about ten of us just running from yard to yard, playing games and tackling each other. Then Paul said, hey, look, that weird guy was at the bounce house and still taking pictures of the kids inside. Then Chrissy said she had to go to the bathroom, and she and two other girls took off and ran by the guy on the way to the house. The rest of us took a hot dog break and got some other food and kept joking and badgering Mr. Z about his grill and smoker. He was making pulled pork for dinner. That's when we heard a yell from down the street, and a bunch of parents were gathering around my friend Chrissy. She said she and her friends went into her house to take turns using the bathroom, when one of them, Aaron, said someone had opened the bathroom door while she was going, and an arm with a camera poked in and took a bunch of pictures. Before she could react, the arm went away, and then she screamed. She was crying and telling everyone what had happened. The parents began looking around, and that's when we again mentioned the guy we saw, as he did have a camera. The party kept going, but a group of dads started walking around checking things out. The band started up again, and a guy was doing this crazy drum solo which attracted everyone's attention. When he was done, everyone clapped and he got up and waved and then walked away. The singer said something like, wow, that was awesome, and they started playing music again. The dads came back and hadn't found anything, and while the party kept going, there was an uneasiness, and people were looking for this guy in the white shirt and camera. He was nowhere to be found. A couple of hours later, there was another scream from a house between band songs. Another kid had been in his bathroom and said the same thing happened. An arm came in, and a camera started taking pictures of him. This really put a halt to the party, and people began looking for this guy more earnestly. Finally, my friend Riley's dad yelled out and a bunch of other dads began running behind the houses, presumably after someone. We all followed and watched them chase a guy into the fields and woods down a path that led away from our neighborhood. One dad told us to stay where we were and we stopped at the tree line. After a little while, they came back with nothing and told us to get back to the street. Everyone was now milling around talking about this strange guy, I mean, who he was, where he came from. No one knew him at all. The police were called and they took statements from everyone. The party was kind of subdued when the band guys asked who the crazy drummer was. It didn't take long to put two and two together. It was the same guy and not part of the band. While the drummer had been organizing some things, he noticed a backpack that wasn't his and he poked into it to see if there was any ID to see whose it was. There wasn't any ID but there was a white shirt and a camera. The guy had somehow escaped the first house he had followed Chrissy to, made his way to the stage, and did the drum solo as a distraction of sorts. The police came back and went through the camera and found dozens of pictures of us kids, pictures of inside homes, entrances and windows to the homes, and more. 
The cops took all the stuff, and that was when the party turned into a block meeting, and they set up a neighborhood watch club. Nothing else happened, but we did try to have more fun. Things in the neighborhood were quiet until just before Halloween. That's when some people started to notice a weird gray minivan cruising the streets. It never stopped, and around the same time they saw this van, a few of the homes where kids lived had been broken into during the day when people were at work and school. Small items, usually kids' clothing, had been stolen, but even that stopped when people started putting in new floodlights and those doorbell cameras started to become popular. That was last year, and the police never found the guy despite the reports that we made. We keep vigilant in our neighborhood and hope that guy never comes back. Neighborhood Trouble, submitted by Raven262. My brother and sister-in-law and their kids all decided to travel to California to visit my mom. We hadn't seen her due to COVID, so we were excited to go and spend some time with her. I was flying single as the fun uncle and was looking forward to seeing my brother and his family as well as my mom. She lives in a gated community, and when we flew in, we got through, and my mom showed us how to get through the gate and where the community pool was, and we were just excited to be together for the first time in over a year and a half. My brother has a little girl and a brother who is three years older. They're four and seven. Really good kids. They're not troublemakers, but they are still kids. So the trouble began when we went to the community pool one afternoon. It's a much older crowd in my mom's neighborhood, and almost everybody there was really great and super nice. All the older ladies doting over my niece, and a lot of the older guys encouraging my nephew in the pool. He'd been swimming for a while, but he was doing some laps trying to avoid the older folks who were just soaking or hanging out. But of course, there's always one asshole in every crowd. This one guy kept yelling at my nephew about his splashing. Mind you, all he was doing was freestyle crawl up and down the pool, just kicking his legs and going slow. He wasn't racing, but this guy just kept yelling about it. I happened to be in the pool while my brother and sister-in-law were hanging out on their chairs and watching over my niece. So I went over to the guy and introduced myself and said, Hey, I'm his uncle. He's not hurting anybody, but if it's really bothering you that much, we can come back later when you're not here. The guy looked at me dead in the eyes and said, why are you even here? I could tell that something was going on with this guy, whether it was meds or something else, but he just seemed a little off kilter. He then told me to get my effing nephew out of the pool or he was going to call the HOA. I didn't want to cause trouble, so I called out to my nephew and say, hey little dude, we gotta get out of the pool. Of course he was bummed, but I told him that we would come back. The guy just stood in the pool with his arms crossed staring at us. I went over to my mom and said, hey, that guy just told us we should leave because the little dude here is swimming too much. My mom just rolled her eyes and said, oh, yeah, he's kind of a pain. All right, no big deal. I figured we would just come back another time, and if that guy was there, we would avoid the pool and figure out something else to do. <laughs> my brother was really pissed, but I calmed him down and said, man, look, it's not worth it. This guy is just an old coot. Let it go. The next morning, I went out for a run around the neighborhood. As I was jogging, just listening to my headphones, I heard a beeping from behind me. Mind you, this was like 7 a.m., and no one was out except for, you guessed it, the same clown from the pool. He was directly behind me, honking his horn and waving his arm out the window. I slowed down and got out of the grass, and he pulled up next to me with his window rolled down and started yelling at me that I shouldn't be on the road running. I was supposed to be on the sidewalk. Again, trying to be the good guy, I thought, okay, no big deal, and said the same to him. I apologized and said, I'll run on the sidewalk, even though I knew I didn't have to do that. So he drove away and I continued my run, just listening to my headphones again. Honestly, I think it was one of your podcasts that I was listening to. When I got to the gate of the neighborhood, I turned around and started running back. What do you know? Suddenly I hear beeping again, but now in front of me. It's the same guy. Now he's yelling at me that I shouldn't be running on the sidewalk or grass because people pay for the landscaping and I'm ruining it. At this point, I started to get pretty pissed because this guy was clearly just harassing me. I stood there staring at him until he finally drove away and went out through the gate. 
Then I just jogged back to my mom's place, told my brother and my mom about that guy again. My mom didn't want to start any trouble, and I don't blame her, because that can be really crazy in a neighborhood with older folks and all the nonsense and trouble that they can cause. But she was angry and said the next time she saw him, she was going to say something, that we were okay to be there. We were just visiting, and he didn't need to be harassing us. That evening, we all went to the pool, and no one was there. So my niece and nephew got to jump into the water and swim around without bothering anyone else that normally would be there. A couple of older folks did come by and just sat in the chairs laughing and enjoying their evening while we were enjoying ours. But of course, here comes the dick. I swear to God, he was following me around for whatever reason. I don't know if he didn't like the way I looked, I don't know if it's because I have long hair or what, but he was not bothering anybody in my family, just me. He started yelling about the kids in the pool, but everyone shouted him down and told him that he needed to just leave and let the kids have fun. He eventually left, but not after pointing his finger at me. That evening, I had to run into town to get some stuff while my brother and sister-in-law got the kids ready for bed. I went to a grocery store to get some things, and as I was checking out, I saw that guy out of the corner of my eye. He had followed me there. I need to tell you, this guy was in his late 60s, early 70s. Not in bad shape, but still not in the shape that I am. But I couldn't figure out what his problem was with me. He didn't even buy anything. But he followed me out into the parking lot over to my car, which was actually my mom's. He proceeded to punch the trunk and tell me that I was not wanted around here. I actually laughed out loud and said, Dude, what is your effing problem? Seriously, I'm just here to visit my mom. And why the hell are you following me? Before he could answer, I decided, Man, don't escalate this. I got into the car and started driving home. This is when he started to drive up alongside of me, then get in front of me, slow down, follow me down side streets, just doing anything to continue harassing me. We got back to our neighborhood and I went through the gate and went straight to my mom's house. I got inside and figured, you know what, again, don't get into anything out here with some guy that you don't know. That night, I heard a tapping on my window in the bedroom I was staying in. I pushed up the little louvers and saw this guy standing outside my mom's condo and he started saying that I needed to go or there was going to be trouble. That was it. I got up. My brother heard me, and I said, I'm going out to get this guy. So we both went outside, and it was around 1.30 in the morning. This guy was still in the yard, but now had a handgun. I can't tell you what kind, but he was pointing at us and said that we needed to leave in the morning. My brother yelled to my sister-in-law to call the cops. I mean, enough was enough. This guy approached us with the gun pointed right at us, and I said, Pal, you better put that thing down. You don't want to go to jail. I was still trying to be cool, but also stick up for my family. He kept advancing, and I could tell he was either drunk or high on something because he just started to yell. I was backing up and thankfully opened my mom's garage with the garage door opener on the outside. He brought his gun up, pointed it at me, I mean literally five feet away from me, and I grabbed the only thing that I could grab out of the garage, which was a coil of garden hose. The guy started screaming all kinds of stuff about white power, and I'll be totally honest here, I am white. But then he kept going on about how we didn't belong out here, and how we needed to get out. I still have no idea why he had such an issue with us. We didn't do anything. So I ended up swinging the garden hose at him and hit him right in the side of the head. And this is where everything went crazy, because he dropped the gun, but it went off. I wasn't aware that could actually happen with a gun, that it could just fire on its own. Shows you how much I know about firearms. But of course, now everybody in the community came out. And he was saying that I took the gun away from him and tried to kill him. I mean, I'm sweating bullets, no pun intended. I was saying, no, this guy came over here to harass us. Thankfully, I had kicked the gun into the grass, and because it was too dark, he couldn't find it. And in his unsober mind, he was looking for it, but couldn't find it or pick it up. So then he decided to lunge at me, and grab me by the legs, and threw me down onto the concrete driveway. That's when I really had had enough. I rolled over and used my jiu-jitsu training. Yeah, I'm really into jiu-jitsu. And I just started to choke him out. All the neighbors were now there watching me do this, and the cops rolled up to see what was going on. 
They pulled me off the guy, and it took a lot because I was so pissed and just wanted this guy to go to sleep. The guy then took a swing at one of the cops, and that was it. I have never been a proponent of police brutality, but I was also not going to stop them from slamming this guy back onto the ground, dragging him yelling, and then slamming him onto the hood of the car. He kept yelling all the time about the silly stuff, white power, and no one knew what the hell he was talking about. We did find out that he was on some kind of medication that he had taken too much of, and had been taking too much of it over the course of a couple of months. They figured that's why he was off all the time, and why people didn't understand what was wrong with him. He was arrested and taken away, and that's really the last I've heard about any of it. My mom said the people in the HOA were talking about not allowing him to come back, the last I heard. I don't know if they can do that or not, but I'm sure they can make his life a living hell, if you're familiar with what HOAs are capable of. They asked if I wanted to press charges, but when I found out that he was on meds, I said no, I don't think he really meant to hurt me or kill me, but they did charge him with second degree something or other, and again, that's the last I heard about any of it. I've never had a gun pointed at me since, but I can assure you that it is a terrifying moment in life when you know if it's a real gun, if it's an airsoft, or if it's a BB gun. Scarily, this one was real. Thank God I got it away from him before he could have shot me or my brother. For a couple of days, it was full of still speaking with the police to make sure that they understood the entire situation. My niece and nephew didn't need to see any of that, and neither did my mom for that matter. But, as I said, I didn't press any charges. But I do think that justice was served, and I didn't have to show up for anything other than the deposition that I did the next day. My mom has not seen him in the neighborhood, which leads me to believe that he's probably in jail somewhere. I mean, what a loser. I'm just glad that it was me and my brother outside, and nobody else in my family. My Escape, submitted by Junebug. I'm sharing this experience with you, but I want to make everyone know right away that my name is not June, but I'm going by Junebug. My parents got me into a cult when I was a little girl. I didn't really have a choice, they were already in, and I'm not going to name names or anything like that either. But I was in, and I will say it's not the one that's always on TV that a lot of the actors talk about. It's not the one that I know will come to mind for a lot of your listeners. This was a smaller cult but a cult nonetheless. My parents thought it was a church, but they ended up becoming so involved that we lived in apartment buildings run by the organization, which is what I would call it, because it's not a church. It was really weird being there. I mean, as kids, we would go to school, but immediately had to go right back home, and we were not allowed to do any extracurricular activities like sports, the theater, or band, or anything like that. Everything was monitored, and we were watched all the time. My parents both had jobs they would go to during the day. But again, right after five, everyone had to go back to what I'll just call a compound. We weren't allowed to go anywhere without permission and had to ask to even see my grandparents and extended family. It was a weird way to grow up, and I was there from the age of three up until 15. Even if we wanted to go for a walk around the neighborhood, we had to ask for permission. Most of the time, they just wanted us praying and doing stuff around the church and the other buildings on what I have already called the compound. My parents ended up getting a divorce, and my dad left the organization. He moved away to Tennessee, and we were still in Pennsylvania. It was really tough because I loved my dad so much, and we never got to see him. I lived with my two younger brothers, who also felt the same way. But for whatever reason, they were always allowed to go visit my dad, but I was not. I don't know why that is, and at this point it doesn't matter. My mom forbade my dad to have full custody of any of us. I would try to call my dad, but every time I tried to make a call out, they said the call could not go through. My mom did not want me using her cell phone to call my dad, and would stop me any time she caught me trying to get a hold of him. One day when I was at school, I broke down and told one of my friends what was going on. She always thought that something was funny because I never got to play after school or go see her on the weekends. She said that I should tell her teacher, but I knew that would just get me in trouble with my mom if I said anything. 
I should say that this place looked totally normal. A church with some buildings behind it. No one had any idea what was actually going on there, and I don't think anybody really cared. So one day, we were on a weekend in the compound, and again, we could not leave on the weekends. But I overheard the guy next door talking about his upcoming doctor's appointment. He, like my mom, had a car, but they always wanted something to be with anyone who left the compound on the weekends, especially if they weren't going to their jobs. I don't know why that was the way it was, and I should state for the record that I'm only 17 now, so please forgive me for my bad writing. I'm hoping I'm making this as clear as I can. I decided to save up all of my money, but I knew that when I graduated from high school, I was going to college and hopefully get away from all this weird cult stuff. I was so tired of having to just pray and hang out in the same buildings all the time. I also want to say that this wasn't like some satanic thing where there were sacrifices or whatever. It was just a weird service organization where we had to go to services every other night and then on the weekends. So you can imagine how weird it was for me to go to school and not be able to interact with my friends at night or on the weekends. Going back to the story. The guy I overheard that needed to go to his doctor knew someone was going to be with him, and he was going on a Saturday morning. So I woke up early and told my mom I was going for a walk before we had to do our regular services. She said okay. I grabbed all of my money and went out to the car that my neighbor had. I was so nervous, but I went over to his trunk and hit the button and popped it open. It was unlocked. I climbed inside and then shut it behind me. A little while later, because I overheard the guy talking about when his doctor's appointment was, I heard two people get into the car and listened to them chatting as the car moved out of the compound and went to the person's doctor. When we got to the place, my neighbor parked his car and both of the people got out. I waited for a few minutes, then pulled the little lever in the trunk, you know, the little one that glows in the dark. The trunk opened and I looked out to see if anyone was there. There wasn't anyone, so I hopped out, and honestly, I didn't even know if I closed the trunk. I just started running. I didn't have a cell phone, and I was desperately looking for a payphone, which they really don't exist anymore. But I finally found one outside of a 7-Eleven, about 10 blocks from where I had just gotten out of the trunk. I had memorized my dad's phone number and called him, and he answered amazingly. I mean, nobody really answers the phone anymore, not these days, especially if you don't know who's calling. I was crying my eyes out, screaming and babbling, and he told me to calm down and asked me what was going on. I finally told him what was happening, and he asked where I was. To be honest, I had no idea where I was. I was never really allowed to wander around town or do anything for all those years. I went to school, just went back home. My dad said to find the nearest hotel I could, which wasn't hard because I was in an urban area. He said to go to the desk clerk, ask for a room, and immediately have the person call him. I did, and he made arrangements as soon as I got the person to call him. I could stay there, and he would take care of that and then come and get me. My dad said to find the nearest hotel or motel I could, which wasn't hard because I was in an urban area. He said to go to the desk clerk, ask for a room, and immediately call him. And then ask for them to make arrangements so I could stay there, and he would take care of it and then come and get me. So I ran up the street to the first hotel I could find, and I went inside and did just what my dad asked. They did call him, and he made the arrangements and explained to them that I needed a room. I don't know what kind of story he told them, but they said okay. I looked at the business cards and realized I was still in Pennsylvania, and my dad said that he was going to be on his way as soon as I got into my room and called him back. We were in constant contact the whole time. He got on a plane and came to get me. I will say this. It was the first time I had ever had room service, as I was never really allowed to do anything on my own, and it was great. Our food at the compound was kind of bad, but it was all that we got. Later that evening, there was a call and a knock on the door, and my dad was standing there, and he swooped me up in his arms, and I just could not stop crying. His phone kept ringing, 
and he finally turned it off and told me that it had been doing that since the morning. My mother was looking for me. He told me that I was coming home with him and everything was going to be okay. He ended up talking to my mom for days on end while I stayed at his house, not going outside, not doing anything other than watching TV and reading. I also liked to draw, so I did that, but I didn't talk to my mom at all. She kept asking to speak to me, and I said I did not want to talk to her, and I was not going back to that place. She threatened to get the police involved, but my dad knew some pretty influential people and made arrangements for my brothers to also move to Tennessee with us. There was nothing that she could do about it this time. I don't know anything about that legal process, but I'm glad that my dad knew some people in high places. The sad thing is, my mom didn't really fight it after a while. I mean, she did when we were all in the cult, but once I was gone, she just gave up on all of us and said good luck. I mean, how sad is that? I have not seen my mom in years, and I do miss her, but she doesn't care. She's still hook, line, and sinker with this weird cult. I know there are some famous places out there that people are critical of, and I can't say anything about them because that's certainly not this place that I was at. This was one place that was only located in Pennsylvania, and again, not like the ones that you see on TV. But it was still a creepy, creepy place, and I'm so happy I got out of there. My brothers now laugh and say I should make a movie about how I got out of there, and they yelled at me at first about how I didn't tell them I was leaving. I mean, they also wanted to leave, too. We're all grown up now and living with my dad still. We're all in college and moving on with our lives, but... Sadly, not with my mom. My mom is not a bad lady. She was just into something the rest of us were not. I've sent her letters and cards, but she returns everything without opening them, and she doesn't answer her phone unless it's my dad calling her, and it was some kind of concern about any business that they had to attend to. I'm so happy I can do lots of things in my life now that I wasn't allowed to do before, but it's tough not seeing your mom. I wish my mom nothing but the best. I love her dearly, and I hope someday she will return my cards and letters, or be a part of my life at any level. But I suppose we all have our own walk, and I have to live with that. Jumping into that trunk was the scariest thing I had ever had to do in my life, but it was the best decision that I have ever made, and I look forward to making more good decisions moving forward. I just wish my mom would be part of those. Jerks in the Woods, submitted by Ray S. In my teenage years, my best friend lived in a neighborhood about a 10-minute walk through some woods between our houses. There was a well-beaten path between them, and it was faster than going all the way around on the sidewalks or streets. There was also a clearing about halfway through where people sometimes party and had bonfires. One night, after hanging out playing video games at my friend's house, I had to get home, and it was around 11. So I grabbed my flashlight and started down the dark path through the woods. And as luck would have it, and in this case bad luck, there were some older guys hanging out around a fire pounding Milwaukee's best. There were three of them, and they were pretty lit as I started to walk by. I just tried to mind my own business, when one of the guys said, Hey kid, come here. I stopped, and after a few seconds said, Uh, Sorry, man, I'm already late getting home. (laughs) Don't want a beating from the old man, right? There was silence until the same guy said, Hey, kid, get over here. I'm not asking. Shit. I weighed my chances of taking off, but knew they'd probably catch me. So I walked over to them and said, Hey, guys, what's up? One of them asked how old I was, and I said 13. And the first guy said, You want a beer? I shook my head, and then he said, How much money do you have on you? I said, I don't have any, which was the truth. Then he said back, Well, then you're going to have to pay our toll by pounding a beer. Now, to many guys, this may sound like an amazing opportunity, but my parents were strictly against alcohol, and if I showed up home with beer on my breath, I'd be a dead man. Guys, look, I really got to get going, I said. 
Then the third guy suddenly jumped up and grabbed my arm. You're going to pound one or else. I still refused, and the first guy just popped a tab on a beer and started dumping it on my head. I tried pulling away, but the guy grabbing my arm wouldn't let me go. I didn't know how I was going to get out of this. So all of us were standing around the fire, and I noticed a log pointed right at the coals. And as they were laughing at me and saying how they were going to kick my ass for not cooperating, out of nowhere I got an idea. I kicked the log as hard as I could into the fire, and it shot sparks up all over the place. They all started yelling, and the guy who was holding my arm let go, and I just took off down the path. I knew they could outrun me, and I could hear them yelling behind me, but I was terrified running away. And amazingly, I got another good idea. There was a fork in the path with one going back to my neighborhood, and another that went down a steep embankment to a creek. I ran for the creek path, dropped my flashlight at the top, and jumped over the side, and then rolled to the left and hid behind a fallen tree. I heard them coming, and one said, There's his flashlight! Suddenly, all three of them came sliding down the embankment right by me. I mean, they were maybe three or four feet away. Then I watched as their flashlights, probably one of mine, bobbed down the path towards the creek. I waited a minute, and then scrambled back up the embankment, got onto the other path, and just ran through the darkness as fast as I could. I couldn't see anything. I was getting hit by weeds, tree branches, totally scratched up. I got back to my neighborhood, got to my house, burst through the back door, and found my parents in the living room. They stared at me standing there trying to catch my breath, and my dad came over and said, Is that beer? I nodded and then through the breaths I was taking, I told them what happened, and that the guys also stole my flashlight. I was relieved when they believed me. Dad told me to get cleaned up, and both of them said that they were just glad I was safe. I'm pretty sure those guys would have beat me up pretty well if they had caught me. And for a 13-year-old in the middle of the woods, alone, that kind of scared the hell out of me. In fact, it wasn't until I showered and was getting into bed that it really hit me. I could have gotten my ass handed to me. I didn't take the path to see my friends for the longest time, afraid that I would run into those guys, and they would kick my ass. But when I finally did start using the path again, I never saw them again. He Won't Leave by Minty Sweet It all started about a month ago, when a man started banging on my door at 6 o'clock at night, yelling for a mic to come out that he needed to see him and get cigarettes. I told him he had the wrong house and to leave. I mean, there's never been a mic in the house. He got even more aggressive, calling me a liar and how he was going to come in and beat that skinny bitch you live with. I tried to call the non-emergency police line because I've never called 911 before. They didn't pick up. Looking back, it was stupid, but it was instinct. After some more yelling, he left. I called my father who was across town to come home and what was going on and he showed up. He called 911 to file a report. The guy came back and started screaming at him. The cops were called again and they showed up an hour after the call and they couldn't find him and told me to defend myself if it came to it. I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I didn't feel safe at home. I can be a strong person but I don't think I can do much against a drugged out man. What made the situation even scarier to me is that as I was going through my driveway camera photos, it showed him walking up to my house hours before, and I had no clue. I have really bad anxiety, so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress, but I managed to finally calm down and convince myself that this was the end of it. Come that weekend, my father went on a trip with his girlfriend, so I was left alone for a couple of days. I had just put on a scary movie when I heard screaming again and a loud bang. I pulled up my camera and saw that he was back, pacing back and forth on the sidewalk and had thrown over a trash can. Again, screaming for Mike. I called 911 and they showed up within minutes this time and were able to stop him down the street. They told me there was nothing that could be done since he hadn't committed a crime yet, but if he came back to call again and then they'd have more reason to hold him. 
Things were quiet for a few weeks, and I again believed that that was the end of it. Until today. This morning, my father and I got in an argument, so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park and sat by a tree watching cars pass every now and then. Just beautiful morning weather. Then I noticed a truck drive down the left side of the park and turned to the street my back was facing. The guy waved as he passed, so I did too, thinking it was just a man going to work. I wanted to show that I was okay. But then he pulled off onto the right side of the park, stopped, and made a U-turn to come back. Red flags instantly went off in my head, so I got up to start walking home. I looked back and saw that he'd turned his headlights off, and he was trailing me. I got to the front of my house, and he slowed, and I got a better look at his face this time, and it looked like the man harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his red baseball cap, and he just glared at me like I took everything in his life away from him. I got to the door and tried to barge in, but my father put the chain on in anger of me walking out, so I had to yell to him that I was being followed and to open the door. He opened it, but by then the truck was gone down the street. I'm terrified to leave my home. I don't have a car to get around anywhere quickly, and I have to bike, but even now I'm scared to do that. I don't know who that man is or was, or what his intentions are, but I live in paranoia, waiting. The Storm, submitted by Kristen J. Between my sophomore and junior years of college at Oklahoma State University, I wanted to take a trip to visit my roommate in Oklahoma. I lived in Springfield, Missouri at the time, and this was just after our spring semester ended. It was Memorial Day weekend, and I had taken off some time off my retail job to make the drive from Springfield to her little town called Mangum in Oklahoma. It was a pretty straight shot down 44 to Oklahoma City, and then over on Route 40. After that, I was going to be taking a bunch of back highways to get to see Sybil heading south. I loaded up my Honda Accord with stuff for the weekend. You know, the normal girl things, plus some outfits for going out, which we planned to do. I had a bunch of playlists on my Spotify and got wired on coffee and started off in the morning around 9 a.m. The weather was great where I was. I was about 20 or 25 minutes outside of Oklahoma City heading west when I noticed the sky getting dark. Of course, I wasn't thinking about forecasts or anything. I just wanted to see my friend and get there as quickly as I could. Some of you who are familiar with this area will know that it's in the neighborhood of Tornado Alley on the map. And boy, would I find out what Tornado Alley is really all about. I was just cruising along, jamming out to my tunes as the skies got darker and darker and I stopped to get gas. During this, I'd unplugged my phone from the charger and put my phone in my pocket. And when I got back in, I didn't plug it back in and just got back on the road. At some point, and it was probably when I got back in my car, my phone slipped out of my pocket and went onto the floor of my car, a little under the front seat. Not thinking about my Spotify not going, I just turned on the radio and every once in a while changed stations to find the music that I liked. I never thought about my phone and why it wasn't in my pocket and never noticed that I was getting phone calls from Sybil. I kept driving thinking about all the fun we were going to have over the weekend and again not paying attention to the dark clouds. There was a sprinkle of rain here and there but nothing that I was worried about or paying attention to. When I got to the junction where I had to head south to Mangum, I knew I wasn't super far away from her. I had planned to be there around 3 or 4 in the afternoon and was right on time. As I continued to drive, I noticed that the clouds were more menacing, and suddenly, out of nowhere, there was a massive hailstorm. Not the kind with giant hail, but really whipping winds, but a lot of hail. I could hear it bouncing off all sides of my car and roof, and I was hoping that I would just be able to outrun whatever storm was there. Again, just another spring thing that happens in the Midwest, or so I thought. As I was driving, I noticed there wasn't a ton of traffic out but there was enough going in the opposite direction. I didn't see anyone behind me for the longest time, and I never really saw anyone in front of me either. Never really had to pass anyone, and no one ever passed me. I kept cruising along as the skies got darker off to my right. 
still not paying attention and just singing along with whatever songs I recognized on the radio, he and my trusty accord kept moving. Then, like out of a movie, I saw the wind really whipping the vegetation or crops or whatever on the sides of the road. I could feel the wind pushing my little accord to the left, and I had to make sure that I didn't take my hands off the wheel to keep things steady. I looked at the time on my radio and said to myself I was still making good time and I should be in Mangum real soon. That's when I saw something out of the corner of my eye off to the right that made my heart drop. The clouds that had been so menacing overhead seemed to be reaching right down to the ground because in fact they were. I didn't right away see a funnel cloud like a typical tornado, but I realized that this storm was going to get even worse the further on that I went. Like an idiot, I figured I could just outrun it. So that's what I did. I just kept going on and pushed down on the accelerator a little bit more than I probably should have, especially with the wind doing its thing the way that it was. Another few minutes went by and I looked over to my right and got the shock of my life. (laughs) There it was, on the ground. Gray and black, a giant whirling of wind ripping things out of the ground. I couldn't tell if it was coming at me or going along with me or what, but again, I figured I could outrun this thing. Bad idea. The rain got super intense, but I could still see this thing towering in the sky moving off to my right. As I kept driving, I noticed there were no other vehicles on the road at all. No one was out there, just me. I started panicking, but kept driving and then looked for my phone. Of course, I couldn't find it in my pocket as it was no longer there and was somewhere on the floor of my car. I glanced down in a craze looking for it to see if I could reach for it, but I couldn't see it at all. But what I could see was this massive pillar of whirling clouds coming right up onto me, off to the right and a little in front of me. I didn't know if I should stop. I didn't know if I should keep going. I just kept my foot on the gas and made the decision unconsciously to keep moving forward. The tornado, which I recognized it for by now, was coming right at me, and again I kept thinking I could outrun it. It was huge at this point, and I couldn't say what it was, F4, F5, UE10, whatever the hell they measure these things on, but I could see that it was coming straight for the road that I was on. I kept driving for another minute or two, now in full panic mode, and screaming, why can't I find my phone? I started to slow down, and it was the smartest thing I could have done. The tornado was even bigger than I thought, and getting closer. I mean, I couldn't even hear the radio anymore, just the sound of wind that was so loud I thought my eardrums were going to break, and the rain pounding on my car. I sat in awe as the funnel got bigger and bigger, and the winds got crazier, and it literally crossed in front of me, probably about a football field away. Tears were streaming down my face, and I was screaming for help. I mean, to who, I don't know, but I was screaming my head off. The tornado moved in front of me, and I couldn't see anything around it or through it, but there was tons of stuff flying in the air. Some of it did hit my car, and there was a lot more hail. It only took about a minute and a half for it to make its course across the road in front of me and keep going off to my left. The winds were still unbelievably intense as it passed by, and I looked up and down the road in front of me and behind me to see if anyone else was out there. Then I remembered my phone and reached down and under my seat where there it was. I grabbed it and immediately called my friend and just kept screaming into the phone, Sybil! Sybil! I'm in a tornado! I'm in a tornado! Before she could even get a word out. I never even noticed that she had left me a bunch of voicemails warning me about the storm and that I should stay put wherever I was until afterwards. Sybil was screaming back at me, and it was a crazy conversation until I finally blurted out that the tornado had just missed me and had moved on. Then I saw some cars go whipping by me, and when I looked up and down the road, I saw a couple of other vehicles had been sitting out there. While I was still yelling into the phone, a car came up to me, and a guy got out and knocked on my window to see if I was okay. His name was Larry, and he was part of a storm chaser group. His other team members were people that I had seen farther down the road that were taking measurements and also watching the tornado as it went by. They were on the other side of it. With tears in my eyes, I told him that I was okay and where I was going. He asked if there was anything he could do, and I said no, 
and it was a crazy three-way conversation with Sybil about who I was talking to. I was so nervous to start driving again, but Larry told me that the tornado was gone and most likely would not be turning around to come back, and I should get to wherever I needed to get as more tornadoes were predicted for the rest of the day. I kept Sybil on speakerphone the entire way to her driveway, telling her about what happened over and over, and how I wasn't paying attention, and how my phone had fallen onto the floor. She was crying too, that I was okay, and just kept guiding me along the roads to her house. When I finally got there, I ran up to her door and practically jumped into her arms, crying my eyes out. I got inside where she was home with her dad, who was equally happy to see me. He made me call my parents and grabbed a bottle off a shelf and poured me the stiffest scotch I'd ever had in my entire life. I finally started to calm down and told them the whole story all over again. I had made it through that storm by the grace of God and promised that I would check forecasts and not leave my phone in a place that I couldn't get to it ever again. We ended up having an awesome weekend and we did watch the news broadcasts that day of the same tornado I had seen as well as some others. God must have sent a guardian angel to get me through that, but it was certainly the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. This was four years ago, and I remember every detail like it was yesterday. I now live in Boston, Massachusetts, where we do get our share of crazy weather, but nothing like that, and tornadoes around here are a rarity. I'm glad because I don't ever want to go through something like that ever again. It's such a feeling of helplessness when you don't know where to go, and quite frankly, sometimes there is no place to go. Like I said, I plan my trips very differently now, even though I probably will never ever see a tornado again. And if I do see one, even if it's a hundred years from now, it will be way too soon. My BFF Nearly Led Me to My Death by Ellen Wayne 23 For some context, I've been friends with my friend, let's call him Leo, since diapers. Our families have known each other since they were in high school, and therefore Leo and I grew close. Unfortunately, Leo's parents died when he was five, and he had to move to Montana with his grandpa Tom. It's not his real name, but everyone at the reservation calls him that. Ever since then, I try to visit him whenever I can, and sometimes he comes to visit me. The year that I went to visit him, everything was chill for the first three days. We played video games, went to town, and generally just hung around. Now something that should be noted is that Grandpa Tom always told us to never go into the forest near their house during the nighttime. Whenever we asked why, he would simply reply that it would be dangerous to do so because we could get lost or attacked by an animal. I knew that what Grandpa Tom said was probably true, but someone from town had told me that those woods were said to be haunted because years ago, a witch had sacrificed three people in the name of Satan and then committed suicide after the town people hung her son as an act of revenge. It's said that if you go far enough into the forest, you can find a giant pentagram on a stone altar, and that if you get close enough, you could potentially be cursed. It was on the fourth night, and I was incredibly bored, so Leo and I decided to play Truth or Dare. It was all going well until he dared me to go into the woods with him. I decided to go because, after all, I really love exploring potentially haunted sites, and so together we snuck out of the house. The walk towards the forest was pretty normal until we went farther in, and we sensed someone was watching us. I also felt an immense sense of danger, anger, and evil. I grabbed Leo's arm and said, Leo, we have to get out of here. It doesn't feel safe to go any further. He simply replied with, Oh, are you scared? Something seemed off about Leo, though. His expression was blank. I usually don't scare easily because I've experienced paranormal stuff my whole life. But something was off about my best friend. It was almost as if he was possessed. I let go of his arm, and as I was about to pull out my phone to call Grandpa Tom for help, Leo grabbed my arm with such an immense force and looked me in the eyes and said, That won't work. No one can help you now. Then he started laughing like a maniac, and I struggled to get away from his tight grip. I was so scared, and so I did what my mom always told me to do if someone tried to kidnap me. I kicked him in the nuts. That startled him enough for him to loosen his grip, and I was able to break free and run back towards Grandpa Tom's house. 
As I was running, I heard Leo yelling profanities, and suddenly he started running behind me. He seemed to be running with an inhuman speed, and in a blink of an eye, he appeared in front of me, which seemed next to impossible. I was tired, but I was not about to let myself be killed in those wretched woods. I ran back towards where we had been when he attacked me, and as I looked back, he just stood there smiling. Something was really off, but I kept running until I came across an altar with a pentagram on it. I thought this had to be the infamous altar where the witch had done her sacrifices. That place radiated extreme evil, and I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to help my friend. I just wanted to go back to the safety of home. I was so tired that I fell on my knees and started crying, when all of a sudden I got an immense headache and nauseating feeling. There was a lady walking towards me. She seemed nice and innocent, but I knew better because she was emanating this evil and there was a smell of rotting flesh. I knew I had to get out of there, but I seemed frozen in place. I did the only thing I could think of, which was pray. I'm an atheist, but I didn't know what else to do. I prayed and prayed for everything to be okay. I opened my eyes to see that she was right there standing looking at me while she held an unconscious Leo in her grip. I looked right back at her and prayed out loud. To this day, I don't know why, but I started praying in Latin and then in Italian. I know these languages. It was just weird. The more I prayed, the angrier she got. And the angrier she got, the louder I prayed. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out of nowhere. The witch turned around, startled, but I just resumed my praying. She turned to look back at me, and with the raspiest voice ever, she said, I just wanted more souls for my collection. I guess I'll have to claim other ones. Either way, your soul seems to belong to someone else. I got chills all over when she said that. She dropped Leo and slowly disappeared into the night. I ran towards his unconscious body and tried waking him up. He wouldn't wake up, and I cried and screamed his name, but it was no use. I thought he was dead. I cradled my best friend while I cried and sobbed, and I thought I would die too because it was getting extremely cold. All of my hope was lost when, by some miracle, I heard Grandpa Tom yelling our names. I yelled back and he ran towards us. The rest of the night went by like a breeze. Grandpa Tom took us to the hospital, and thankfully Leo was fine. You may all not believe me, but I swear I will never go back to those woods again. Manhunt Game, submitted by Universal Jazz Growing up in the 80s and early 90s, we had a cool neighborhood and played a lot of games with all the kids who lived there. We had the normal pickup games of baseball and football and hotbox before the bus came to pick us up in the morning, but the nighttime games were always way more fun. Stuff like hide and seek, capture the flag, and what we always just referred to as army. We also played a game called manhunt, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. It's kind of like reverse hide and seek, where one person hides and everyone else has to look for him or her. Super fun as we would get into teams of two or three and then spend time running around in between houses of their neighborhood looking for the fugitive in hiding. We were always coming up with new and cool ways to hide, but there were basic rules like you couldn't go inside a garage or a house or a shed. Wherever you did hide, it had to be semi out in the open. We had a creek that ran around our neighborhood and that was a border. You couldn't hide on the other side of that. There were woods between the neighborhood and the creek, so a lot of times that's where people hid. Coming up with new places to hide was always a challenge after you've played it so many times, but it was never a boring time when we were playing Manhunt. The time that I'm about to tell you happened in the fall, a couple of weeks before Halloween. I lived in the Northeast, so the sun goes down fairly early at that time of the year, and it does get a little cooler out. Certainly not the freezing of winter, but that time of year when everyone is wearing sweatshirts and stuff when we played outside. It was a Saturday night and a bunch of us in our early teens decided to get together and play some manhunt before going to one guy's house, my friend John's, to watch a movie and have popcorn. I will say right now that our neighborhood was fairly tight-knit. Everyone knew each other, and if families weren't good friends, we all certainly knew everyone on a first-name basis. This is long before the 24-hour news cycle of the terrors of what happens when kids play alone outside. 
Back then it was basically, tell us where you're going, stick around the neighborhood, and if you hear us calling, get your ass home. Everyone also had their own method of calling the kids home. My dad had a very powerful whistle, some families had air horns, other dads would just yell. At any rate, we all met in my backyard around 7 o'clock to start the first of the manhunts. My buddy Rick was chosen, and he was never a good manhunter player. He always wanted to be the hunted, but he sucked at it, and we always found him within a short amount of time. I will say this. Our version of Manhunter might not be the same as what anyone listening might have played. The hunted could move around if someone yelled out, FUGITIVE! That allowed them to continue the game and made for more fun for everyone rather than just someone hiding in the bushes. But like I said, and I'm saying this because I know he'll listen to this, Rick sucked. One team found him right away, and we had to change up who the man to be hunted was. I teamed up with my other friend Casey, and there were three other teams of two, with the odd man out being the man hunted. After Rick's flaming debacle, my friend Jordan was going to be on the run. So we gave him his five minutes, and then all the teams started to fan out to look for him. Casey and I took off towards the woods near the creek, and I figured Jordan was going to find a new spot there. He, like the rest of us, loved to play the game, but also liked to keep things fresh. Some guys had their go-to spots, which kind of made the game boring. We were all wearing camouflage or dark clothing except for a couple of people. And on this particular night, Jordan was wearing a dark blue or black hoodie. I think the only thing white on it was an Adidas logo, and that caused some trouble for me. Jordan had hid pretty well, and it was about 15 minutes into the game, and no one had found him yet. We bumped into the other teams, and they still hadn't a clue where he was. One of the teams went back into the housing part of the neighborhood, while Casey and I and the other team stayed in the woods and along the bed of the creek. Still, we couldn't find Jordan. He was whipping our ass at this point, and Casey and I decided to split up to maximize our hunting efforts, but stayed within earshot. I was creeping along the bed of the creek with the moonlight shining off the creek when I glimpsed someone behind a big rock that I knew had to be Jordan. Dark sweatshirt, new spot, had to be Jordan. Part of the rules were you had to stay in place until someone spotted you. And I was beginning to think, though, that Jordan was breaking the rules by moving around on us. I would be so happy if I could catch him. I didn't say anything as I got nearer to the figure, and my thoughts were correct. As I got closer, the dark shape got up and started to move towards the woods. I kept along being as quiet as I could, just following, and again, not yelling out or anything. I was going to prove that Jordan was a cheater. I didn't hear anyone else around. I just kept following the dark figure as it walked through the trails of the woods, then came up to a clearing before a bridge that separated our neighborhood from another neighborhood in town. It was a big bridge with a big road that had lights all the way across it. I mean, basically it split the village where I grew up. Going on the other side of the bridge was certainly way out of bounds, but that's where Jordan was heading. I was so psyched I was going to bust him, but wanted to do it under the lights of the bridge so everyone who was playing would know he was a cheater. I stopped and whispered for Casey, but didn't hear anything back, and when I looked back at the edge of the woods, I realized that no one else was over where we were. I just kept following Jordan to another pile of boulders right before the bridge, but I noticed he had been speeding up, so I had to pick up the pace to catch him. When I got to the big boulders, I knew he was hiding somewhere amongst them, and finally yelled out, Hey, asshole, you're done cheating. From behind me, I heard something, but before I could turn around, a forearm got me in a headlock and started to pull me towards the bridge. I quickly realized this was not Jordan. This was someone much bigger and stronger than me. I was trying to yell and fight back, because I knew this person dragging me underneath the bridge was just taking me farther away from my friends. The farther I was dragged away, the less anyone would be apt to hear or see something wrong. The guy never said anything, except one time he said, Shut up, kid, as he pulled me along underneath the bridge towards the other side. When we got there, thankfully, there was a group of older kids drinking beer at the edge of the bridge. These were the kids that we all called the dirtbags, but looking back, they were just the same as everyone else. Funny how guys who did that stuff were looked down upon as the bad kids, but when we all played sports and did the same thing, we were studs. When they saw me getting dragged along, 
I saw all of them stand up with their beer cans, and one guy in a very harsh voice said, What the hell do you think you're doing? He wasn't speaking to me, he was speaking to the guy, who then stopped dragging me and let go of his headlock a little bit. I was beyond terrified at that point, despite being 13 years old. I had no idea who this guy was or what he was thinking, but he certainly had bad intentions if he was dragging me along as far as he did. I heard the guy start saying something about me being his little brother and he was trying to get me home because I was late. But then I recognized one of the guys in the gang as a dude who lived in my neighborhood that we all liked despite our parents saying he was a bad kid. His name was Eric and he had long black hair, listened to heavy metal, and had a really beat up Camaro that we all thought was awesome. He recognized me right away and said, I don't fucking think so, dude, and all the guys, all four of them, started to come over to us. The guy tightened his grip on my neck for a second, and then he threw me to the side and I fell into the creek. The guy made a run for it and got past Eric and his friends, but when he got into the light from the other side of the bridge, he turned to look at us, and the hood that he had had on his sweatshirt pulled back, and it was a guy I would say was maybe in his 30s, thinning hair, he had a weird pinched face, and I remember he had some teeth missing. He ran like the wind away from us after Eric and his friends chased him for a bit, after coming back to me to make sure I was okay. I was fine, other than just being scared and soaking wet. Eric told me to get on home and to not worry about the guy. He offered me a beer, but I was only 13 and I didn't think it was a good idea at the time. I thanked him and his friends and started hauling my butt back to my friends. When I got to them, I told them what happened, and they told me Jordan had been cheating, but no one had cared at that point after they heard my story. We all went back to my friend's house for the movie, and I told his dad what happened. He immediately called my dad and made me tell him what happened, and my dad said I had to go home. I thought he was mad at me at first, but when I got there, we called the police to let them know what happened. He was happy I was safe. The police were already ahead of us. Apparently, the guy had been called on for peeping into the windows of another house while we were playing, and then he did it again in another neighborhood on the other side of the bridge after he let go of me. They picked him up, and from what I learned over the next couple of days, he was a guy who lived in the town over from us who was considered one of those weird guys. That's what we called them back then, but today we just call them out for the pedophiles that they are. I have no idea what happened to him after that, but we were all scared as kids for a little bit to be running around in the dark. Despite the fact that we knew he had been arrested, the specter of a guy like that hanging out where kids were playing was pretty spooky. Eventually we got back to playing Manhunt and all of our other games, but there was always an element of horror whenever we went out at night. Our parents changed rules for us for a little bit, but things went back to normal not very long after. Sometimes when I go back to visit my parents who still live in that neighborhood, I'll go for a walk down by the creek at night and kind of relive that scary time. It sounds kind of lame as I write this down and send it to you, but as an adult, it really hits home how creepy some people are, how danger really can be lurking around every corner, and how I was super lucky that Eric and his buddies were there to put a stop to something that probably would have ended up very bad for me. When my kids were growing up, I let them do their thing too. And I hate when people say things are so much different now, because they're not. The same predators were out there when I was a kid as they were in the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, and all the way back. We just hear so much more about them now. Always be safe is what I preach to my kids, and I advise the adults of kids today to do the same. More Than Lock Your Doors, submitted by Carol Y. This story started when I was a little girl, but continued into my late teens. The first house my parents bought when I was five years old. Up until that time, we'd been living in apartments, and my parents found a house they really liked for what I now understand was a very cheap price. I had no idea about the history of the house at the time, but I would find out later why the price was so right. When we first moved in, I really loved it. My sister and I had our own rooms, We had a big backyard to play in, and I was just starting school. There were new kids in the neighborhood that became my fast friends, and it was just so much nicer than living in the apartment we had been living in before. I mean, this was a long time ago, but even at that age, I could appreciate why my parents bought the house. 
They bought it in August and we moved in just in time for school to start. And around that time, I started to wake up in the night and see a woman standing in my room. It wasn't all ghostly or anything. It looked like a real woman with long scraggly hair standing there, holding something in her hand. Even though I was scared, I would usually just close my eyes and after a while when I opened them, the woman would be gone. I told my parents and they told me it was just a dream and that I shouldn't eat as many sweets as I did before bed. Honestly, it did feel like a dream, so I listened to them. And when I would wake up, my room would be empty. A dream it must have been. But around Christmas time, it happened again. I woke up, and there stood this woman. In the dark, I could see she was holding a hammer. And that really scared me, and I screamed. I closed my eyes and heard my dad running up from the basement. He'd been down there putting together some of our toys for Christmas, and my mom was at work at the time. She worked an overnight shift as an ER nurse. I should mention that my bedroom was the only bedroom on the first floor. My parents were wary about me being there, away from my sister and them, when I slept, but I loved all the windows and begged and begged for that room. When I heard my dad running up the stairs, I opened my eyes and the woman was gone. My dad came in asking if everything was okay, what was wrong, and he had a frantic look on his face. I told him that the woman I had told him about before was back in my room, and it wasn't a dream. My dad flicked the lights on instead of just standing with the hall light on and looked down at my floor. He didn't say anything right away, but even at five, I looked around and saw wet footprints on my carpet. They came and went out from my door. My dad told me to stay where I was and turned around and went into the hall and was gone for a minute. He was checking the doors and windows and also on my sister. She had woken up from my scream all the way upstairs. Then I heard my dad make a phone call to my mom and I overheard him saying he didn't want to scare her, but something happened and he didn't want her to not know that he was calling the police. I couldn't make out much of the conversation, but I did pick up on the words footprints and I heard him saying, I don't know, all the doors are locked. My dad did call the police, and in the middle of the night, there they were, talking while my sister and I had hot cocoa in the kitchen. The police were very nice and asked me questions about what I saw, and I also mentioned at that point that I had seen the woman before, but had thought it was a dream. My dad had his hand on my shoulder and said, yeah, that is true, but at the time, he figured it was a dream. The police looked around and then looked around outside. There wasn't much to look at. The grass was wet, but this was in the south and we didn't have any snow or anything like that. The police talked to my dad again and then left saying to call if anything else happened. My dad was and is a great guy, and he knew that my sister and I were shook up. It was about 1.30 in the morning at this point, and neither of us could sleep. So my dad did his best and made a game out of it. He said we could all sleep in his room and watch a video on my parents' TV. He propped up all of the pillows to make a sort of makeshift fort to protect us, and then he made us some popcorn too. We all eventually fell asleep and were woken up by my mom when she came home in the morning. Christmas came and was awesome, and eventually all of this was forgotten by me and my sister. But every once in a while, my dad and mom would have a conversation that we weren't supposed to listen to. It wasn't until later in life that he told me that they had been talking about the owners of the house previous to us moving in. My dad was an avid hunter and had lots of guns he kept in his safe in the basement. When I was a little older, I learned that he kept one in his sock drawer. A forty-five, he would later teach me to shoot. So the years went rolling by and nothing else happened in the house, and my childhood was really great. All of the things that had happened were forgotten, and my sister and I just grew up with awesome parents, great friends, we loved our school, we were really involved there, and it was just a great place to live. That is, until my freshman year of college when I came home for Christmas break. My mom had changed my room around a little bit, but it was still a bedroom, and that's where I would stay when I was home. I still loved all those windows. One night during the week between Christmas and New Year's, I was talking to my new boyfriend who lived about an hour away. I was hoping he would come over to meet my parents during the break, and we were planning that visit. We talked into the late night and eventually hung up. I got up to get a drink of water, brushed my teeth, and was really tired from the day and just fell asleep with all of my clothes on while I laid on my bed. Sometime in the night, I heard a noise that woke me up. 
Usually I slept with a radio on. I love talk radio, and now I fall asleep listening to your stories, Uncle Josh. But this sound sounded like my door opening, and it was enough to wake me up. I opened my eyes and cleared out some of the sleep to see a woman with long, scraggly hair standing in my bedroom. I froze, a scream stuck in my throat that wouldn't come out. It was the same woman. She looked a lot older, but it was the same woman. And the shock of my life came when I saw that she was holding a hammer in her hand. I sat there, frozen, staring at her as she just stared back at me. She didn't say a word, just stood there staring at me. I started to speak, and she raised her arm up with the hammer. <laughs> now I screamed. I screamed as loud as I could. And the woman stopped raising her arm and put her other hand to her mouth with a finger up in front of her lips and said, It'll be over in a second. I sat up in bed and she sort of moved towards me and I heard my father running to my room. He got there and flicked the lights on and I could see he was holding up his forty-five. He was also taken aback by the woman standing in my room. For a second, nothing happened until he screamed, Who the fuck are you? Get away from my daughter! At that point, he was now pointing the gun at the woman's back as she hadn't even bothered to turn and look at him. Dad wasn't waiting for her to respond. He slammed his knee into the back of her knee and she fell over with a yell onto the ground, dropping the hammer. My mother came up behind my dad and my father screamed, Sherry, call the fucking cops! The woman just lay there on the ground, not saying anything, but kind of crying. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I peed my pants, I was so afraid. So my mom was freaking out as she called 911, and my sister wasn't home, and the only other thing going bonkers was my golden retriever, funnily enough named Bonkers. Bonky kept trying to get by my dad to get to me, but he was holding him back, keeping his 45 pointed at this woman laying on the floor. A few minutes later, the police arrived and got the woman up and out of my room. She didn't say anything at first, but just looked at me with these crazy eyes and said, It would have been over in a second. I had no idea what she meant, but I think she was inferring that she was going to kill me. Yeah, that's a little bit of a thought to have as a late teenager. Long story short, this woman had lived in the house before my parents had bought it. She had always been a disturbed young girl who never got treatment because her parents were also really messed up. She had once tried attacking her mother with a hammer, so they kept her locked in a room in the house for 15 years of her life until other family members stepped in and got her removed for treatment. She severely needed that treatment. Something happened to the parents and some other issues came up with the house, and I don't really know what happened to them, but I know they lost custody of the girl and they were forced to sell the house. Now here's the kicker. This woman had been let out of a treatment facility on her own recognizance. She was now in her early 30s, and come to find out that when I was five, she had actually escaped from the same place. So basically, she got out twice. And here's the other kicker. My parents had never changed the locks on the house. This crazy woman had remembered a spare key that her parents had hidden somewhere outside near our back door. She had simply just gotten the key and gotten into our house. I mean, how fucked up is that? And how fucked up is it that every time she came in, when she left, she put the key back in its hidden spot? I suppose the early lesson here is change your locks the minute you get a new place. The police arrested her and the whole rigmarole started all over again with her not being competent to stand trial and she was remanded to another mental health facility. She's still there now, and while we couldn't prove that she was going to harm or kill me, the prosecutors made a good case that she at least was posing a very dangerous threat, and that she remained locked up in the facility without the possibility of getting out again. I don't know how any of that works, but this last thing happened about 25 years ago, and like I said, as far as I know, she's still where she was. After I graduated from college, my parents sold the place and all of us moved to different states. I don't think we had anything to do with this woman personally. She was just going back to the only place she knew. Where she got the hammer, nobody knew. It was not one of ours. Now I have my own family and I made sure to change the locks on both of the houses I've lived in. 
my sister and I still tease my parents for not changing the locks in the first place on that first house. I mean, after all of this time, we can sort of joke about it. But the truth is, sometimes in the night, I do wake up and think that I see that woman standing in my room. I know she's not there, but I guess it's something that will always be stuck in my mind and in my dreams for the rest of my life. Sometimes you can't call the cops for help by don't want them to find me. My apologies for the length of this story. I've tried to cut it down some, but it's simply a long story. I'm hoping this is vague enough to remain anonymous, because those involved are still out there somewhere, and I'd really prefer not to encounter them again. However, I will say that this story happened in the U.S. For reference, I was 20 years old at the time, living in an apartment with my mom and little brother while I attended community college. When we first moved in, the apartments were very well run, but within a short time, the managers were transferred elsewhere, and the replacements did not have the skill at keeping undesirable types of people out. The police became a regular sight in our neighborhood, and it was a rare day that would go by without seeing them. The woman who moved in downstairs from us began openly dealing drugs. People would come and go at all hours and leave, stuffing little bags of various substances into their pockets. Mostly weed, but definitely other stuff as well. <laughs> they couldn't have been more obvious if they tried. And there was always a crowd of shady-looking men with large, unfriendly dogs hanging around the yard, or even sitting on our stairs. They'd act like it was a personal insult if we interrupted them to walk up or down the stairs and would just generally be quite intimidating. The breaking point didn't come until their customers started getting the wrong address and coming to our door instead. We'd be sitting in the living room and hear footsteps come up the stairs and the door handle would jiggle against the lock. We became religious about keeping the door locked tight. One night I was home alone and somebody started just beating on the door, not knocking. It was more like he thought it was a punching bag, all the while screaming barely comprehensible obscenities. I grabbed the biggest butcher knife out of the kitchen and shouted through the door that I was calling 911, and he ran away. In hindsight, I probably should have called, but I was just relieved he was gone, and since I hadn't seen what he looked like, I figured it wouldn't have been that much use. After that, though, I always pushed the couch in front of the door before I went to bed. My mom had had enough of this at this point. She tried going to the manager first, and it was met with a total lack of interest from her. So, she decided there was nothing to be done but contact the police about it herself. So, she called about it, and she got off the phone looking happy because at least they seemed to take her seriously and promised to investigate. The first sign of trouble came the next night. There was a lot of thumping and bumping downstairs, and a peek out of the window showed people going in and out of the apartment, carrying cardboard boxes to a dented van on the street. Bright and early the next morning, the police raided the place, and you guessed it, clean as a whistle. At first we didn't realize the implication of this. When it started back up again a few days later, my mom called the cops again, and the same thing happened. At this point, we realized it probably wasn't a coincidence. Somebody in the local police department was most likely tipping them off. One of the curses of a small town. I was angry and disappointed, but at least we tried, right? It never hurts to try. <laughs> I wish. About a week later, I was getting ready for an evening class, and I had just gotten out of the shower and was in my bedroom in a bathrobe, picking out what I wanted to wear. I heard a loud banging on the front door, but I didn't think much of it. We'd been expecting a package from the UPS man, and he always knocked loudly. My mom's footsteps went to answer it, and I heard her say something. I couldn't make out the words, but her tone caught my attention, and I felt like something was wrong. I reached for my doorknob, but before I could open it, it flew open in my face, and all my shocked brain could grasp was, huge man with a gun in my room before I was grabbed by the shoulders and flung to the floor. I honestly thought the drug users downstairs had come to get us once and for all. I thought I was going to be raped and murdered. At this point, I should mention, I had an issue with one of my wrists for years due to a childhood injury. I would had it operated on twice, and this was not more than a few months after the second operation. Naturally, I managed to land with my full weight on that wrist, and something crunched horribly. 
I did what any tough person would do and immediately burst into tears and sat there clutching my wrist waiting to die. I guess I must not have looked very threatening like that because he stepped back a little bit and that's when I saw police on the front of his vest. The next few minutes were a bit of a blur. Somehow I was hurled into my living room where my mom was and the cop left without saying more than, wait here. I was completely dazed. My mom was pretty much having hysterics and there were all kinds of shouting and activity going on outside. After a short while, the cop returned and informed us, to paraphrase, Sorry, wrong address. Shit happens. We can't be perfect all the time. My name is Officer Shinkin. Here's my card, and you can call it if you have any questions. And then he just left. I went straight to the emergency room and spent the next two hours getting my wrist x-rayed and put into a splint. And then I went to math class because, you know, I didn't know what else to do, and I was terrified of being at home. Needless to say, I learned nothing whatsoever, but the support of my teacher and classmates was reassuring. The next morning, somebody knocked on the door. When my mom answered, it was Officer Shinkin again. When I heard his voice, I started hyperventilating and went to hide in the bathroom, so I didn't hear what was said, but I heard when my mom slammed the door. She was absolutely furious. I'd never seen her look so angry. Apparently, good old Officer Shinkin brought along a carefully prepared document that we were to sign. It basically said we understood that it was all a terrible mistake and that we would not be seeking legal action. She told him to go to hell and shut the door in his face. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. It was one of the nurses at the emergency room saying somebody claiming to be law enforcement had just come by trying to get copies of my emergency room visit records. But they didn't have permission to release those, and if I wanted him to have them, I'd have to come by and sign the forms. Oh, hell no. Further questions realized that, yes, the man's description matched Officer Shinkin, and yes, he was not the officer involved, but was investigating the incident. I started to find that pretty much everyone that I told my story to would get a funny look on their face and say, This cop, was his name Officer Shinkin? And then they would launch into their own horror story about him. My high school teacher said that he shot one of her former students during a marijuana bust and left him on the ground to bleed to death, but another officer on the scene did first aid and saved his life. One of our neighbors said he dragged said neighbor's uncle down a flight of stairs by his feet, hitting his head on every concrete step. Another neighbor said Officer Shinkin pulled them out of their shower by his hair and held a gun to his head over a parole violation. And a Google search said he'd once been fired from a nearby city for shooting a handcuffed man in the head, killing him. He claimed it was somehow self-defense and was fired but never charged with any crime. The medical bills for the ER visit ended up being over seven grand, and I didn't have insurance, so basically I had no choice but to file a suit. I found myself a lawyer and submitted a claim, and that's when shit really hit the fan. We started getting disturbing phone calls at all hours of the night, sometimes just silence at the other end or the sound of somebody breathing, and sometimes graphically sexual comments. When we stopped answering the phone, they just let it ring until the machine picked up, and then immediately hung up and then did it again. My mom went to her car one morning and opened the door, only to discover the handle had been covered with some sort of caustic chemical. She washed it off but still ended up with burns in an emergency room visit. I had just gotten my permit and was out for driving practice when it began to rain as I went down the highway. I flipped on the windshield wipers and discovered they'd been coated with grimy motor oil. It smeared across the windshield and completely obscured my vision. Fortunately, the road was empty enough that I was able to slam on the brakes and pull to the side of the road without getting into an accident. Other things started happening too, less severe but sinister given the context above. Somebody cut out a bunch of metal malicious skull designs and tacked them onto our wall or pushed them under the door at night. What the fuck? I still have no idea what that was supposed to accomplish. Furniture was stolen off the porch, my boots vanished when I left them out there once, and oddly, several pounds of weed in a plastic sack appeared on our porch one morning. 
My mom called the manager to get it without going outside, and for once in her life, the lady did something useful and actually fetched it and threw it in the dumpster. I have never felt so hopeless in my life. I mean, what was I going to do? Call the police? It was around this time that a friend who lived abroad suggested I come stay with him for a while for my own safety. I dropped out of school and left the country for six months while the lawsuit worked its way through the courts. My mother and brother moved in with family and then to another town without submitting a forwarding address. Eventually, my tourist visa ran out and I had to come home. I was a complete nervous wreck and I ended up settling out of court for a relatively small sum of money just to make it over. My lawyer had gotten a copy of the search warrant they'd used and it was riddled with grammatical errors and switched my apartment number 18 and the number of the unit down the street 25 at random. The suspect was somebody with an entirely different name who looked entirely different from any of us and who apparently sold some oxycotton pills. She lived in Unit 25. I saw a copy of her driver's license. It said right on the front of it in nice clear letters, Unit 25 is her address. I don't know. I have no proof, but it was obvious that somebody had been tipping off our drug dealers downstairs. And I often wonder if that wrong number on the warrant was not a mistake at all. Perhaps it was meant as a retaliation for trying to get their friends in trouble. I've now regained full use of my hand, which my doctor had told me might never happen. I no longer have a heart attack at loud noises, and I only feel slightly uneasy when I see police uniforms, rather than having full-on panic attacks. It's six years later, and I'm only now beginning to reclaim my life, kick the PSD, and go back to finish school. I feel like I lost the best part of my 20s to these jerks, and I'm still bitter about it. I currently live with friends in an informal situation. My real address is not on any documentation, and I get all my mail in a P.O. box in another town. Depending on which document you're looking at, I supposedly live in five different places scattered from one end of the country to another. And I'm not going to change that until I move a lot further away from where all this happened. As far as I know... Nobody involved ever faced any sort of consequences. Stalked After Ballroom Dance Classes by Idiot Eswich I apologize if I have some errors. English is not my first language. For context, I am now 26, and I met my stalker around 14 or 15. When I was 14 years old, I decided to take ballroom dance classes. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. There you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consisted of mostly teens between 14 and 17, there was a really tall, I mean almost two meters tall, 21-year-old guy, Philip. We had a nice chat the times we danced, but he seemed weird. And because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends... I told him where I lived when he asked me. So the stalking began. At that time, I didn't realize that it was stalking. I just thought he had much time on his hands and that it was annoying. Philip would ride on his bike from his home. He lived one town over, over to my house, and ask if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I wasn't home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very, very long time. At one point, the stalking ended for a few weeks, and Philip also did not come to dance classes. At the time, I became part of a friend group of a boy I fancied. For some months, he had a girlfriend, but they split up after, and I became his girlfriend. Unfortunately, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking, Philip was in mental hospitals multiple times, and every time he was, I was glad because then I had some peace. When I was 16, my family and I had to move because our landlady had thrown us out. She wanted to live in the property herself. So we moved one town over. We started living two streets apart from my stalker, and every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house. It wasn't as often as before, but still. At my father's birthday, he rang again, and because my family had guests, they told me to open the door. 
And there he was, looming over me like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave, and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it. So I was standing there, afraid, begging him to leave. At one time, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, He's your friend, it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and I begged and pleaded, Philip, please leave. At one point, he was even kneeling and sitting in the doorway. It was almost two hours later that he finally left. And at that point, it was obvious for me. I mean, I finally realized what type of behavior was going on. He was a stalker, and he was fixated on me. The next day, I sat down with my parents and told them that I was afraid of Philip. And my dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I didn't want any contact with him. So he left. After a few more incidents like that, he stopped showing up at my door, and I thought I got rid of my stalker. But every time I started to live happily, starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, or an email, or a gift showed up, and would send me back into my fears. At 20, I was out of school, and to pass the year, I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school in a voluntary after-school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two, my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed because she had called the cops. Apparently, Philip was again every morning at our door and asked for me, and my parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again. Finally, after the cops told Phillips three times to leave and he ignored them, they arrested him, and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops heard him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report at the police for stalking and trespassing, but the officer said that they couldn't do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order, but it didn't go through. A week later, Philip had sneaked into our garden, and, like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. Okay, throwing rocks at a girl's window is not romantic. It's creepy. Idiot me opened the window, but did not see anything until it clicked, and I ran downstairs and told my dad that my stalker was in the garden. Philip escaped. A week after that, I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again, and because we had no way of seeing who was at the door, I opened it. And there he was again, telling me that he missed me, and was saying that he had peeked through the blinds in the windows of the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents weren't home. If they had been, I would have run, but like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend, a different boyfriend at this point, came over. I had sent him an SOS SMS, and he was on his way. After my boyfriend arrived, he told Philip to leave, and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he now also had a girlfriend. After that, I didn't see Philip again for a long time. A friend told me he was taken by the men in white coats because he had believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later that I got a letter from court. I was to be a witness and told to attend in the case of the assault of Philip. Apparently, after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a big fight with his girlfriend and hit her, and because she was scared, she played dead. Philip called an ambulance, and the police finally had something against him. After the hearing, he was admitted again to a mental hospital, and I finally got a restraining order, and he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. So it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house, but I'm sharing this now only because I believe I'm seeing him again. But it can't be. He doesn't know where I live, and he hasn't shown up at my parents' house. But I believe I have seen him when I leave the house. I just need reassurance that it's not him again, and that I'm safe at my home. Run-In with Drug Dealers, submitted by Patrick22. When I was in high school in the suburbs of a larger town out in the Midwest, 
I was a pretty decent football player, wide receiver to be exact. This has nothing to do with the story, but I also served as the team kicker for whatever reason. I had a good leg and was in track, so I guess that's why they picked me rather than having a full-time kicker. I was also a wrestler, and this happened between football and wrestling season. There was a guy on the football team who was two years older than me. I was a sophomore at the time. And for whatever reason, he didn't like me to begin with. Most of the guys on varsity were juniors and seniors, but there were a couple of sophomores like myself. This guy I'll call Bob would harass me all the time in practice and was a lot bigger than me, so I just shut my mouth and took it. But the real trouble came towards the end of the season, when his girlfriend dumped him for me. I knew the trouble that I was bringing on myself if I started dating the girl, but she was a year older than me, she was super hot, and my loins couldn't say no. Of course, that didn't go well with him. Bob was more than pissed. He would seek me out in the hallways and try to start fights with me, and I kept telling him I wasn't going to fight because I didn't want to lose my wrestling season or get into any other kind of trouble. He would just call me a pussy and push me, but he never threw a punch. Friends between us told me how much he hated me and that he was planning on kicking my ass at some point and how they didn't want to get involved. They liked us both, and they told me that they kept trying to talk to him, but he was so pissed that his girlfriend dumped him. I was dead meat in his eyes. Ah, yes, the stupidity of youth. Get dumped by a girl and beat up the guy she starts dating, like it's that guy's fault. Anyway, despite it being colder, I was at the outdoor track of the high school one evening, running to cut some weight and just stay in shape for wrestling season. I took wrestling a hell of a lot more seriously than I did football and was planning on improving my record that year. The year before, I came in third in our regionals, and this year, a goal of mine was to win and go to states. So I was just out there as it was getting dark and thinking I needed to wrap up my run and get home for dinner, when I noticed a figure step onto the track about 200 meters away of the 400-meter track. Whoever it was just stood there, and was far enough away that I couldn't see who it was. Well, when I got to that end of the track where the gate to get to the parking lot was, it was clear to me that it was Bob. It was also clear that he was there for one reason, to fight me. I showed no fear as I got closer to him and stopped about ten feet away from him. He just looked at me and said, Okay, fag, this is it. No one else is around. No one else needs to know. Obviously, I knew what he was talking about, so I said, Look, man, I'm not going to fight you. He called me a pussy, and I said, Look, man, I know I can kick the living shit out of you, but that doesn't change anything. We could both get kicked off our teams. He was on the basketball team. I took a step to kind of move around him, but he moved in front of me again and said, Nope, we're doing this. At that end of the track where the parking lot was, was also the bus garage. Behind that was a dip that went down to a little ravine where a creek ran by our high school. It was usually a hangout for all the heads to smoke their weed and do their thing without prying eyes seeing them. Again, I tried to use reason with Bob, but there he was wanting to fight. That's when a car pulled up and three dudes I recognized as grads, like graduated from high school three or four years ago, got out of the car and started walking along the bus garage. I don't think they noticed us right away. But then I heard a noise behind me and turned slightly to see two other older guys I had never seen before coming up from the ravine. Had we known exactly what was going down, I'm sure Bob and I would have run before we finally did but it took the two older guys finally noticing us after the other guys met up with them that we knew something was wrong. Without going into all the details, we were witnessing a pretty big drug deal for our town. We found out that later after telling some friends what had happened to us. As Bob and I stood there looking at them, one of the guys noticed that we were standing on the track and yelled over, The fuck are you looking at? The guy he was with said something to him that we couldn't hear. And then all five guys were looking at us, and even in the dark, I could see two of them take out knives. I said to Bob, you're going to have to put your fight on hold. He just said, yep, and we started to back up a little bit. There was no way we could go through the gate to get to the parking lot, and the woods at the far end of the track were a bad idea. The only outlet for me in my mind was the far side of the track. There was a fence there that led up to the baseball fields wide open fields. Nowhere to hide, but a good place to run. 
I certainly didn't want to mess with anyone with a knife, and I certainly didn't want to deal with a drugged-out bunch of guys with knives. I whispered to Bob, we need to book it to the baseball fields. I don't think they'll be able to catch us. We started to turn, and we heard one of the guys yell out, Hey, assholes, get over here now! That was our cue to start running, and run we did. Even though Bob was bigger than me, he had his sprint shoes on that night. We hauled ass over to the other side of the track as the guys gave chase to us. We cleared the fence, got onto the baseball fields, and kept running. I turned around once to see the other guys getting over the fence, still chasing us. We kept running until we got up to the outside wall of the school and ran alongside that. I hadn't even thought of my car that I'd left back in the parking lot. And when I did, I thought, fuck it, I'll go back and get it later. Bob actually didn't live that far away and had walked over to fight me. Anyway, we got to the edge of the school and ran to the other parking lot that ran in front of the school. We came up short about halfway as we saw a car light staring right at us from the parking lot. It was the two older guys, the drug dealers. They stood there and one called out, You who, get your asses over here. I thought to myself, this is not good. Then I got a brilliant idea. I told Bob, hey, if you're looking for a fight, I think it's standing right in front of us. He kind of grunted, and we both took off like rockets towards the two guys who I think were a little bit surprised we were running right at them. I took one guy, and Bob took the other, and we plowed right over them. They fell onto their asses and leather jackets, and we kept running. As we were rolling along, I heard a loud bang from behind us, and I swear that a bullet went right by my head. It was just this really strange whizzing sound. I can't say for sure. All we knew is that someone had fired off a shot, and to this day I believe that a bullet or something went right by my head. Bob and I kept running to the street that led to our school. We crossed over it, almost getting hit by two cars. We jumped another fence and started running willy-nilly through Bob's neighborhood, and he said to cut over here to get to his house. I followed him, and we finally burst through his back door, and he led me down to the basement. His mom called out, Bob, is that you? And he said, yeah, mom, I'm just down here with a friend. Oh, I guess we were friends at that point. We collapsed into two chairs, not saying a word, just breathing heavily. Then we were just staring at each other, and I piped up, holy shit, man, did that guy shoot at us? Big Bob nodded his head. We didn't say a word for another few minutes, and I asked, should we tell somebody about this? He said, I don't know, should we? And I shook my head. Those guys probably couldn't have recognized us, and I certainly didn't want any more trouble. Neither did Bob. I looked at him again and said, you still want to fight me? And a big smile came over his face, and he said, no, man, no. We ended up talking for another hour or so, me blowing off dinner and his mom bringing pizza down to us. He kept saying how he should never even have been out there. Had he not stopped me, I probably would have just gotten to my car and gone home. And that's when I remembered my car, and to call my parents to let them know where I was and that I was okay. Bob and I ended up becoming best friends after that. As a matter of fact, he convinced me to go to the college that he was going to when he graduated. We're still friends to this day. I was the best man in his wedding, and he was the best man in mine. Funny how a terrifying time can make enemies the best of friends. We still laugh about that night, even though one of us could have gotten shot. Two idiot guys who got unified by a larger group of idiot guys. I've been through lots of other things in my life, including time in the military, but that night still stands out as one of the scariest things that's happened to me. Thankfully, in the military, I was never shot at. The time at school was the only time. I don't recommend it. The Haunting at the Brewery by The Apothecarium About a decade back, I used to work at a brewery pub. It was set in a pretty big and old building from the early 1900s. I worked there for a couple of years, and most of the time it was pretty chill, but backbreaking at times. In my time working there, I had two experiences that I can only describe as supernatural. The first one, it was a particularly late night, and I was tasked with closing up the hangar and loading docks. 
Closing it up was making sure there wasn't anything obstructing where the trucks would park, stacking up any loose crates, and turning the lights off and locking it all up. I was about done, so I turned off the lights, and as I was making my way to the door, a beer bottle came rolling towards me from the dark between the tall stacks of crates. It wasn't forceful or anything, it looked like someone gently placed it on the floor and then rolled it towards me. I didn't think too much of it, so I picked up the bottle and placed it inside a half-empty crate. I turned around, and as I started walking, another bottle came rolling from the same place. Then another one. Tired and thinking it was a co-worker trying to fuck with me, I shouted, Hey, all right, you got me. Come on, I gotta close it up. I expected to hear laughter or something, but instead it was dead silent. I waited for a couple of minutes, then turned down my flashlight and started looking around the stacks of crates for what I thought would be a giggling co-worker. After searching each corner, I gave up. I was a little weirded out at this point, but I just picked up the two bottles from the ground and placed them in the same crate as the first one. I turned off my flashlight and shouted at the darkness, All right, I'm locking up. See you tomorrow. Just as I finished saying that, a crate full of bottles fell from one of the stacks and landed two feet from me. Glass shards and beer exploded everywhere. The next day I told my boss about it, and he said it was probably a rat. The thing is, those crates, when full, probably weigh about 20 pounds. I mean, how could a rat push it? Talking to my co-workers, they told me that they also experienced weird stuff during closing hours. My second experience happened again when I was closing the place. This time I was closing the pub. When closing the pub, the last thing you usually do is restock the walk-in freezer. And the freezer is probably just as old as the building itself, and it sits underground, right beneath the bar. I was down there filling that enormous thing with kegs and crates. Being a very old freezer from a time when safety wasn't a big concern, the thing didn't open from the inside. No handle. Nothing, just a flat, plain steel door. So I did what I always did when I had to go inside there. I put a keg securing the door open. I was halfway through my task when I heard the door slamming shut. I rushed towards the door, but it was locked shut. I started pounding on it, but the only other person there was my boss in the office, two floors above me, and probably with his door closed. I tried my phone, but since I was locked underground inside a steel and lead box, I had no service. I was only wearing jeans and a t-shirt, so things were getting chilly pretty quickly. My face was going numb and my hands were getting stiff. I made a blanket out of cardboard, but it was doing very little keeping the cold at bay. The only reason I didn't freeze to death was because I had a date with a regular, and she went there looking for me. She asked my boss where I was, and when he couldn't find me, he went to the basement and found me inside the freezer. I'd been in there for about 45 minutes when he found me, and I was starting to consider writing a letter to my parents and drinking myself to sleep. My boss installed a chain to keep the door open after that, but I refused to ever walk into that death trap again. The weirdest part, the keg I had holding the door open was at the other side of the room when I got out. It was a full steel keg, not something that would just slide away, let alone quietly. I stopped working there shortly after for unrelated reasons.